Well, before we come to the preaching of God's Word, will we pray together, please, and ask God to help us. O oh, our blessed God, we come and ask of you as your people, seeking your face that you would give us hungry hearts. You tell us, blessed is the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You promise to us that if we would open wide our mouth, you will fill them. Some of us here, Lord, have young men in our families who have great appetites. And when we would put little snacks in front of them, that does not satisfy appetites. We ask of you, please, that you would give us such spiritual appetites this morning, that we would not be interested in small snacks, but that we would want a feast for our soul. Oh, feed us, we pray. Give us that sense within us that we cannot get enough of the Word of God. We cannot get enough of the God of the Word. Come and meet with us by your Holy Spirit. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it seems that today's weather conditions are in for this morning's sermon. Despite what some try and say, we know from experience that the Christian life is not all sunny skies. Certainly there are seasons when the Good Shepherd leads us to green pastures. There are seasons when it leads us beside still waters. But life is not always like that. There are times, even like today's weather, where life seems to be overcast. Life seems to take on a gloom. Uh, life seems to be something like a, a cloudy condition for us. There are those times when we pass through dark valleys of difficulty, dark valleys of discouragement and disappointment. It's like the threatening Billowing clouds are gathering and that sense of oppression, that sense of discouragement, of despondency falls upon us and, and we enter into that experience and it's very real. Psalm 23 is such a realistic description of the Christian's experience. It speaks of good and it speaks of tough times and it even covers verse 4. Where it says, yea, yes, he says, this is what it's also like. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now in that verse, in verse 4 of Psalm 23, we find sunlight for cloudy days. We find a comforting shepherd for sheep in times of distress. You see, what we will see this morning, God willing, is something that I believe every believer, every Christian, to varying degrees, can really relate to. Remember what we've said several times over recent weeks, that Psalm 23 is it's like the record of a sheep bleating, or a sheep talking. David, he's a sheep of God himself. In his own walk with God, he had experienced the highs and the lows like you and me. David had found rest beside those still waters. And David had found himself, remember from last week, far away from God. David wandered into sin and David needed his shepherd to restore his soul. But David also knew what it was to go through times of deep sorrow Seasons of dark distress. And so here is David, he writes as a sheep of God's pasture. David writes out of his own real experience. He writes by the Spirit of God. And he writes words of immense relevance of Christians living in a stressful age and in trying times. Now, 
At this point in the Psalm, verse 4 this morning, there seems to be almost a hint of the shepherding practices in the Middle East. So far as we've worked our way through this psalm, we've seen the first three verses, the sheep is being led by the shepherd to nice quiet streams, to green pastures, and even maybe going astray for a while, but it's the sheep cared for, if you like, in the home paddock. But now the sheep are moving from the home paddocks up to the hill country. Because summer is coming in the Middle East and it's time to move to other fields. And during these months away, the flock is in the alone with the shepherd. And we see something of the personal nature of the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd in this latter part of the psalm. All of this we'll see is in the context of high mountains, deep ravines, steep cliffs, and even wild animals. Hone then in on verse 4 this morning. There are two things I want us to simply think about and I think we'll see them quite obviously here. Firstly, the sheep's condition, and then secondly, the sheep's comfort. Let's then try and unpack the sheep's condition, and we're understanding as we go with the flow, as it were, of the that David is taking us through, that we're now going up the mountains. And as we get up the mountains, we've got to head through deep ravines. And this is a place where there are lurking shadows. This is a place where there is darkness. This is a place of real danger. And David begins to describe what might be a deep and fearful experience. And David is describing something here that is very personal. He describes his condition to be like being in a shadow of death. Now that expression in the Hebrew language is actually a compound word. It's like for us putting a couple of words together and it carries the idea of deadly shadow or or deep shadow. And the phrase, the shadow of death, is not just used here. This is probably the only one that we're familiar with. But it's used many places in the Old Testament. For instance, in Jeremiah 2 verse 6, it's used and it seems to be the idea of great affliction and, and imminent danger. It's used in the book of Job several times. In Job 24, verse 17, it speaks of fear and of terror. In Job 10, from verse 21, it speaks of dreadful darkness. You see, the whole idea of the shadow of death is something that in the idea of a great affliction and imminent danger. It's a sense of fear and being gripped with terror. It's a time of dreadful darkness and blackness. It's a valley of dense darkness, deep shadow. It is a valley of the shadow of death. Now, often this verse, as many of you know, has been used to comfort those who are passing through or about to pass through the dark valley of death itself. But of course, even then, for the child of God, Death is not an end, but really is is a door, if you will, into a, a higher and a more excellent life of intimate contact with Christ. Death is but the dark valley that is opening up into an eternity of sunshine, of delight with God. It's not something to fear because it opens up to something far more beautiful, far more perfect life yet to come. Which is why our good shepherd told us, Lo, I am with you always. Even through the valley of death itself. But I don't think we should limit this verse here to the trial of death. It certainly does bring comfort. It certainly does speak to that here. But I don't think that's all that this is saying. Because when you look more closely at David's words here... What do we discover when, he, when we look at the tent uses? He says, though I walk through. He's, he's, he's speaking not in the future tense about what he's going to go through in death. He's speaking about what he is going through then and there. You see, David also seems to have in mind something that touches every one of us from time to time to varying degrees. Yes, we will all experience death. But I think he also has something else in mind before we get to death itself. This season of dreadful darkness, a period of deep distress. But that is not something confined to David. 
You think of your Bible. You think about characters in the Bible. Probably the one that would come to many of our minds because of our recent conference would be Elijah, surely. Out there in the wilderness under the juniper tree. How is he? He's very low. He's moping about, feeling sorry. He's entering a season of real darkness. Remember his words? He says, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my father's. Remember Jonah? After he'd done his preaching mission in Nineveh, and he got outside the city, and he sits under that little tree that God put up there, and then God put it down with that attack of that wonderful little creature. What does Jonah say? It is better for me to die than to live. You see, not just in the Bible, though, friends. Throughout church history, many of the greatest men of God have struggled with the season of despondency. Even the great gospel preacher that many of us love, Charles Spurgeon, it may be a surprise to some of you to know that he often suffered with bouts of depression. Greatest poets and hymn writers, William Cowper, who we sung about of one of his songs earlier, He lived most of his days in the valley of the shadow of death, in this deep darkness. Something more of his story, that this man was what we would probably say to Danic, depressant for the whole of his life. He lost his mother when he was only six years old. He was deceived by the servants in his house that his mother hadn't died, but that actually one day she would come back again, which of course was not true, and that had a deep effect upon him. When at school was bullied by older boys, he was claustrophobic. And in those days, doctors used a terrible method of shutting him up in a small cell. You could imagine the effect that that had upon his battered emotions. God was merciful to William Cowper's soul and he was a saved man. And for several years, he actually became the personal assistant to the great preacher of God's free grace, John Newton. He helped him in ministry and only. And yet much of his life, he was in this dark valley and he even attempted suicide several times. He suffered hallucinations, nightmares, delusions, panic attacks. For years, he was a recluse, And he didn't cope with pressure. And though John Newton cared so tenderly for Cowper, a number of years, Cowper believed everyone hated him. He even believed that John Newton wasn't John Newton, but that Newton was an imposter. He was convinced that his food was poisoned, and he often lapsed into the thought that God cast him off forever. Cowper was saved. But Cowper went through the dark night of the soul, the valley of the shadow of death. Now, though Cowper's case might be extreme, Cowper, Spurge, Elijah, they're not the only ones who have or do experience this valley. Many of God's people go through this deep emotional valley. More, I think, more of God's people go through this than we might even imagine. There are some Christians who, in public, but in private, they are passing through a dark valley. David had experienced this valley. Most of us know, to some degree, that feeling of, being downcast. That, that sense of a spirit of weakness. That, that unexplainable sense of fear and terror. Many of you have been through it. Some of you are currently in it. You see, David touches on something here that is so very real and so extremely relevant. Now remember what's happening in the psalm. The sheep are leaving the home paddock and they're on their way to the high country for the summer season. And it's inevitable that the sheep need to go through certain valleys as they begin to ascend. 
It's the way to get to the mountaintop. They come to this deep valley where they walk along. It's dark. It's dreary. We could imagine it surely. There are shadows on either side of the path because of the, the side of, of the ravine that is high. Little light, little sunlight gets there. So the, there's, it's quite slippery. It's, it's dangerous to walk there. Hiding in the hollows of the rocks, the dark shadows are potentially wild beasts poised to attack. And then above them, there's this potential danger that, that, that only the fall of one of those rocks, heights, could lead to a whole landslide down into the ravine. It's a dangerous place. Because of such dangers and difficulties, how do the sheep go? Well, the sheep's steps are marked by doubt. Step after step of uncertainty. This is a real difficult stage of the journey. But one of the main things we need to see, friends, this is the way in the wisdom of the shepherd that he is leading them. I want you to notice closely with me, more closely now at the text, as David describes in detail the sheep's condition. What's he say there in verse 4? He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley. What an important perspective that David has here. We mustn't miss it. He recognises that this is not the place where he will stay. He is walking through this deep, dark, damp, dangerous valley. He knew he would come out of this valley. He knew that soon the valley of gloom would be behind him in his experience. You see what a helpful perspective we have. When we go through those times of darkness, those deep valleys of personal struggle and even depression, we convince ourselves that this will be where we will be forever. And David says, yes, this is, a, this is valley. But I am walking through this valley. I'm not taking up my residence here. This is not where I stay as a sheep. I'm passing through this and my good shepherd in his wisdom has led me to this valley and he is leading me through. Now, again, as we come back to the words that he uses to describe this experience, he says he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, David recognises as difficult as... The period was that he was going through. It really was difficult, but at its worst, he recognised what it was. It was a shadow. A couple of months ago, I was at home outside doing a little bit of work and I'm minding my own business, trying to stoke up the fire that we were trying to burn up a whole lot of rubbish and see the last bit of the rubbish burnt. And here I am with my, with my little spade shoveling it away and, and suddenly, out of nowhere, I had a snake strike out at me. My son's standing some metres away in the adjoining paddock and he sees me and I thought I was realising what I was doing at the time but I, I, I lunge back out of fear of this, this, this snake. It was... And I retreated. Now, I can tell you that snake was not a shadow. It was real. Now, if a shadow of a snake had a strike at me, I would not have the same reason to retreat quickly, though I probably still would retreat. (laughs) You see the point. Let me ask you younger ones. When was the last time that a dog's shadow bit you? When was the last time that a bee's shadow stung you? Now, if most of us are honest, if we find ourselves in one of those situations at night and we're by ourselves and there's a bit of moonlight and out of the corner of our eye we see a moving shadow, (laughs) that might spook us, it might startle us, but we know that the shadow can't hurt us. And that's the point. 
I don't think David is, and I'm certainly not trying to belittle the shadowy experience, not at all. But we need to see these things for what they really are. David calls them shadows. Now, what do we need for there to be a shadow? Well, there needs to be light. Friends, let's not forget that behind every dark, shadowy experience stands the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus doesn't cause the shadow. What causes the shadow? It's when something gets in the way of the light. That's what is the shadow. But behind every shadow is the light. You know, it was on the eve of Cowper entering into an abyss of madness that he, he wrote that song that we sang before. He sort of sensed that he was about to decline into a horrible period of depression. And that's when he wrote these words. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence... Their heart, a smiling face. Cowper wrote, out of the depth of his own experience. And friends, when we are in the midst of an oppressing shadow, and some of you might be there today, we need to remember to look to the light. Because then the fear and the terror that fills our hearts, and it is real, but then we'll be able to see that removed again as we see the reality it's a shadow and we look through the shadow and we see the light who stands behind the frowning providence because there, there is a smiling face. So the first thing we see in this, in this text this morning is the sheep's condition but now move with me secondly as we think about the sheep's comfort and here the, the sheep's comfort, I guess we've already started to see more fully now described for us when David goes on to say, I will fear no evil. Why? You know the answer. For you are with me. Here, believe, believers, we find the, the sunshine. This is the real sunshine. The sunshine on the cloudy day is here. Here is the comfort that the shepherd gives to the sheep. Though I walk through this real experience, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You. Well, it's the one described way back up in verse 1 that we saw right at the start. That's the theme of the whole chapter. The Lord, Jehovah, what is he like? Well, we described that something at the start of our service this morning. He is so great. And there is no one like him. This is the one David could sit with me. Many years ago when the common means of travel overseas was not by plane, but on board a ship, there was a ship going through uh, incredible wild seas. Uh, the weather was very threatening and everyone on board that ship was greatly distressed about this whole situation. The common passengers, they were terrified, they were fearful for their lives. Death seemed certain. Even the experienced crew who had weathered many a storm at sea, they were full of fear and anxiety themselves. It didn't look good. But on board that ship, little boy, and that little lad acted as if nothing was wrong at all. And there he was playing among all the passengers. The passengers are, are terrified. Women and children are crying. And here's a little boy. He's happily oblivious in, in, that, in that context. What's all the fuss? And someone actually asked him, why are you so happy at such a time? You know what his answer was? He says, well, my father's the captain and he knows how to manage. My father, he's the captain. You see, he did not think that that ship would go down while his father was in command of that ship. Why? 
because he had absolute confidence in the captain and therefore there was no fear. And David says, yes, this is a very real valley that I'm going through. But Jehovah, my shepherd, is with me and with him with me, knowing who he is and what he is like, I fear no evil. You see, he knew the captain of the ship. He knew that the captain would get his vessel safely to the haven. He had absolutely full and complete confidence in the captain of his soul. As the ship, David knew his shepherd. And Jehovah was his shepherd and with him in charge, he says, I have no reason to fear. No evil will come to me with my captain of this ship. Brethren, the good shepherd, if you are one of his sheep, the good shepherd is with you. It's his promise. He never leaves his flock. And even though we go through periods of difficulty, we like David, like that little boy, no reason to fear because our shepherd he will safely get us through our father is the captain he is the sovereign ruler of all things he will get us through the tempest of life he will get us through that dark dangerous valley remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 if God is for us who then can be against us. Or maybe we could change that. If God is for us, what can be against me? He went on to say, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God. And what's he doing? He said, also makes intercession for us. Think of it, friends. He sympathizes with our weakness. The book of Hebrews says, in all points he was tempted as we are. And yet so often when we go through the dark valley, we think that no one else has gone through this. And we can dwell upon the eye. Like this text, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like as if I am the only one and no one has been through this. No one else understands what I'm going through. Friends, that is not true. Jesus has been there. He has been tempted in all points as we are. You think of his life for 40 days. He was in a deep valley of temptation, all alone, out there with Satan. Was that a picnic? No, that was a deep trial. That was a valley, a shadowy experience. And then right toward the end of his life, at the very point when he needed his disciples the most, we read, don't we, in the Gospels, that they all forsook him and fled. He was alone. In the Garden of Gethsemane, He called three to come and be near him to pray with him. What do they do? They fall asleep. Could you not watch with me one hour, he says. And there in that place of prayer, wrestling with God alone, what does he say? He says, my soul, exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Oh, that was a deep valley in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see, the one who is with us, he understands all about us and the valley that we pass through. I know evil. For you, the one who can relate to my experience, you are with me. What else does David, the sheep, bleat out in verse 4? Right at the end. Your rod and your... They comfort me. Two implements. Some commentators say, well, they're actually the same. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I don't have a full knowledge of shepherding things in the Middle East. Some say that there are two different implements here and that these are, these are different. The rod, it's like a weapon. It's a, it had flints, often we're told, that were embedded into its heavy end for greater effect. 
And then there's the staff, and perhaps we can more easily relate to what that is. We've seen pictures, uh, uh, maybe we've just seen some new bishop get into position of authority, and he's handed this stick with a little crook at the That's sort of the idea. Often they were about six foot long, and, and often they had that crook at the end of the stick. Well, the point being, with these in the shepherd's hand, they brought comfort to the sheep. You know why? Because those implements or implement serve several important purposes in the shepherd's care and comfort for the sheep. There's at least four. And the first one is they were used to count. You see, the shepherd would use the rod as a means to help him know and to be able to keep a calculation, to count the So as the sheep, say for instance, would come into the fold, he would hold out the rod, he would hold out the stick, and as they passed under the rod, he would then count them one by one. And he knew then, therefore, if one was missing, even one out of a hundred. So that if there was one out of a hundred, well, we know the parable, he would leave the ninety-nine in the home paddock and he would go and look for the one that he hadn't yet counted yet. You see, surely that brought comfort to the timid sheep they would not get lost in this dark valley, that they were completely safe because the shepherd has a rod to keep a track of them. I might feel sad. I might feel gloomy. But I can find comfort in this very truth that I am amongst the purchased flock of God. And as we saw last week, not wanting to go over that material, but remember John chapter 10, that Jesus has promised that none of his sheep will not even one. Brings comfort to know that this rod is used to count. Secondly, it's used to quicken. Because if a sheep becomes negligent and remiss, which is not to do, that the shepherd would use his rod to quicken their pace. None can linger when the shepherd has in his hand the rod. Oh, what a comfort. Because he will not allow me to linger in this dark valley. Now, in my folly, I would perhaps loiter in times of depression and I would be uh, having a pity party and be feeling sorry for myself, but my shepherd in his love, he urges me onward, he prods me, he quickens me in love to move forward. It's comfort. To count. Thirdly, to guide. If the sheep lose their direction in the shadows, in this valley... The shepherd uses the rod to guide them back onto track, to back to the safety of the mob, back to the flock, so that they can continue through the valley. And again, friends, of darkness and fear, it's so easy for us, isn't it, to get off the track and to lose sight of those things. But what a comfort that the good shepherd has a rod and a staff. He will guide you back onto the track. And then fourthly, to protect dark valley many places many crevices in the rock where uh, perhaps wild dogs or lions in that culture could hide ready to pounce on the sheep but the sheep are not defenseless left to themselves sheep are defenseless but not these sheep because they have a shepherd who has in his hand instruments that are useful for defending and, and protecting the flock It's Philip Keller in his book on Psalm 23, this man, remember, who once was a shepherd and became a preacher, he he recounts this, this little incident and I'll quote it to you. He says, I used to watch the native lads having competitions to see who could throw his rod with the greatest accuracy the furthest distance. The effectiveness of these crude clubs in the hands of skilled shepherds was a thrill to watch. The rod was... In fact, an extension of the owner. It stood as a symbol of his strength, his power, his authority in any serious situation. The rod was what he relied on to safeguard both himself and his flock from danger. Friends, our good shepherd is able to, to protect us through all the dangerous sections of our journey on the way to heaven. 
What a comfort. Not one of his sheep will be destroyed, but all will be protected from the fatal attacks of the enemy. He may try. That is the enemy of our soul. But he will not succeed. You see, as the sheep in God's flock, what a shepherd we have. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. So friends, when we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, when we go through those experiences, those seasons of great affliction and imminent danger, when we are overcome with that sense of fear and terror, when we go through those periods of dreadful black darkness, over as our shepherd we can know true and lasting comfort that he is with us and that he will get us through the valley that he will continue to lead us and get us eventually one day to those lust pastures above with everlasting bright sunshine so my friend if any of you are feeling like you are in the midst of a dark valley today that valley full of dangers and lurking shadows. My friend, look to the shepherd. In him is all the comfort you need today. And if you're not in that valley today, maybe you will be next month. In that situation, resolve now that in the midst of that, you will look to the light behind the shadow. Because in him is all the comfort you will need then when you pass through that valley and for all of us the real comfort comes as we see who this shepherd is the real comfort comes when we understand afresh what this shepherd has done for us shepherd of God's flock the Lord Jesus has walked through the valley of the shadow of death in this world and he did it on our behalf why was he in such agony in the garden of Gethsemane in Gethsemane he was in his deepest valley in his life up until that point his words in that prayer recorded in Mark 14 give us a little window into the struggles and the valley that he was in I quoted it before I quote it again Jesus said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Think of that. Jesus, the Almighty God taking on human flesh, was in the midst of a day. So deep, he says, it's unto death. He felt that this experience that he was going through would take his life. He was wrestling in prayer, wasn't he? What's he say in that prayer? Effectively, he says, Lord, I'm into the cup, the cup of God's wrath that I will have to drink tomorrow when I am at Calvary. Just the sight of that cup, just the thought in his mind of what that would mean for him, even that itself almost killed him. And then at Calvary, he did drink the cup. The wrath of God was poured out on him as the bearer of sin. The deepest, the dark valley that any man has gone through was at Calvary. He not only felt alone, he was alone. Remember his words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I understand disciples forsook me. I understand why the nation forsook me. But why have you forsaken me? The eternal father turned his back upon the eternal son. He not only felt alone, he was alone. What was happening? The shepherd was in the thick darkness, literally, for those three hours why he entered the darkness 
so that we might enter the light. The good shepherd was laying down his life for his sheep. Jesus endured death so that we might live. But Jesus passed through the valley. Blessed be God. He didn't just die and stay in the tomb. He came out the other side of the valley just for himself, for his sheep. He rose so that all who would put their personal trust in him, all who would enter those via him. Remember, he's the door of the sheep that they may enter into the safety of the fold and know him not only as saviour, but as the care and comforting shepherd that we read of in Psalm 23. The real comfort is for us when we know who the shepherd is and what he has done for us. Are there some here this morning and you do not have Jesus as your personal shepherd? You know what it is to go through difficult times. Maybe even times where you feel sad or sense of depression. But because you're not a Christian, you don't know about the, that we've seen David speak about here. Do you not want to have this shepherd as your shepherd? In your current state, you are vulnerable. Or you might try and fudge on your own way. It's a lonely path. My friend, today you are lost. Therefore you need to call out to the shepherd who will come and save you. You're like a sheep who has gone astray. You've wandered off into some dark valley. You are lost in your darkness and it's only a matter of time before you die in that and you go to a place where you will be locked in to eternal outer darkness that's why you need to come to this caring, loving comforting shepherd he laid down his life for his sheep he died for sinners like you and me are you not envious of the sheep who have been found who have this shepherd as theirs to be cared for in such a loving way by this shepherd My friend, this shepherd, who is my shepherd, he can be your shepherd. Call out to him. He'll save you. Even now. And then, you know, as you face the valley of death itself or you face those shadowy dark times in your life to come, you then will be able to say with complete confidence with many of us, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. May God be pleased to minister by his Holy Spirit comfort to each of our hearts today. Let's pray together, please.